Greetings and welcome to the Minnesota Stormwater Seminar. I am John Gulliver and I'll introduce the seminar and our speaker today. This series of seminars is co-sponsored by the Water Resources Center, the San Anthony Falls Laboratory, and the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. It's funded by the, by the Minnesota Stormwater Research Council, with, which allocates funding which comes from the Clean Water Fund and from cities and watershed districts, et cetera, in Minnesota. Our speaker is Dr. William F. Hunt III. The William Neal Reynolds Distinguished University Professor and Extension Specialist in North Carolina State University's Department of Biological and Agricultural Engineering. Bill has two bachelor's degrees, one from, uh, from NCSU, one in civil engineering and one in economics. Interesting combination. And an MS degree from NCSU in biological and agricultural engineering and a PhD from Penn State University in agricultural and biological engineering. And that's an interesting background, Bill. Dr. Hunt is a leader of the Stormwater Engineering Group at North Carolina State University with a focus on low impact development and green infrastructure. He has co-authored more than 130 refereed journal articles, two books, and many extension publications. His team has designed or, and or monitored more than 250 stormwater control measures. So he uh, is not your typical university professor. He has been there, done that. Um, he also conducts workshops, uh, typically 20 to 25 workshops in North Carolina, the U.S., and internationally. Bill was a chair of the second International Low Impact Development Conference held in Wilmington, North Carolina, 2007, co-chaired the fourth International LID Conference, Philadelphia, 2011, and was a co-chair of the second Stormwater Operation and Maintenance Conference in Wilmington, North Carolina, 2022. Today, he's going to give us a talk on stormwater as it relates to nutrient treating. Please welcome Bill Hunt. That's nice. Please call me Bill. That my first my name scares people, and it really I hope I'm not a scary dude. It is great to be here. Uh, I love whenever John calls and Andy. Where's Andy? Boom. I, I always try to answer. I'm not really the best email person, but um, I always try to answer because I, I love you guys. I do. You guys are so lucky in Minnesota to have the resources you do here on this campus. And I'm going to flip it. You guys are so lucky on this campus to have the, the citizenry, the governmental organizations, the watershed districts, the engineering firms that value what you do. All right. And so this is a great place. Uh, I, I'm not going to leave North Carolina, but if I ever did, and I thought I could handle the weather, this would be the place that I would go. We have a maybe a somewhat smaller version of what I, mean, I, I almost uh, we do a lot of the same things in North Carolina that y'all do here, uh, but not not to the same extent. I'm, I'm I admire you guys for everything that's going on up here. All right, I usually move around a lot. Andy put me on a leash. And so I'm going, to, I'm going to stay somewhat here, but I'll try to move a little bit. And I may leave camera and come back. I'll know this is home base, but I might go see Randy just to talk to him at some point. All right. So by show of hands, when you design a stormwater control measure, okay, how many of you basically say, what do I have to do to get it approved? All right. Let's just be honest. How, how many of you design stormwater control measures? Okay. Now. So no two of you that do, that's what you do. All right, that's what we do. Well, sometimes I have done that. How about that? I have to done that. Sometimes we also put design practices that we're going to put in the ground and we monitor them. That's, that's one of the things that we do, like y'all do up here. All right. So I would, this is my, I'm basically looking at how many like orders of, uh, how many, uh, gosh, distribute, come on, two sigma, three sigma. You know what I'm trying to get at. Standard deviations, thank you, gosh, <laughs> standard deviations. Like I'm thinking somewhere between two and three standard deviations of practices that go in. That's the way we do. We're like, what, is the right, what do the regulations say we have to do? And if we're a good designer, we're gonna make sure we, we check every box. All right. But there are other incentives out there that can help push you beyond just what you have to do to get it approved. 
And it is really cool because these are, and you talked about the economics background. This is, when this came, I said, like, this is fine. I get to, to implement economics because it's basically a market. There are market mechanisms that can help you take a practice that checks the boxes, but push it to another level because you can make money in doing so. All right. And I looked online in Minnesota. I don't know if it's active, but online it looks pretty good. I'm going to show you some stuff from Minnesota in a second, as if you know. And But I'd say probably the most famous place in the United States where this is happening is Washington, D.C. And what they do there is they're worried about, am I okay here or am I off, am I off screen? <laughs> it's like, I'm going to be like, oh, my God. Uh, well, they, they, they worry about volume mitigation. They're trying to get rid of volume. And they actually have a market there that they've established that if you put a stormwater practice in the ground, this is, imagine a half acre parking lot, a bioretention cell goes in, all right? And you put this bioretention cell in at the end, just retrofit your parking lot with it. And in this case, you monitor it and show how many gallons of water you're putting in the ground. The District of Columbia will pay you, in fact, They'll pay you $80,000 a year for six years. This practice cost about $150, all right, all told, by the time it was designed, constructed, and monitored. But you make that in two years, which means the next four years you're making money, all right? So the idea that you can do something, and you're not required to do it. They're just trying to put water in the ground, and it's an incentive program, all right? The same thing apparently is on the books here. How many of you have? practiced nutrient trading within the stormwater realm. Great, and we will compare notes later, all right. <laughs> but some of the key things that y'all have on your website, all right, involve estimating how much pollutants coming in, all right, perhaps to a specific practice, so having a tool that can do it, all right. Look at what, how much the practice is able to remove, okay. And having a tool is really important. You're gonna see me come back to this quite a bit, because it's a respected tool, it's a required tool for use. In North Carolina, that specifically is used to look at the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that stormwater control measures uh, are able to remove. And then another thing Minnesota does, they talk about these trade boundaries. That's a pretty big deal here, because a lot of, in, 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 here meaning in North Carolina, because a lot of the trades for nutrients that we see, the ag sector is the one that you can easily get nutrients removed by putting in things like riparian buffers or practicing something called controlled drainage. I think y'all have controlled drainage up here in some of your flat areas. That's the ag engineer part coming out, okay. Um, but one of the big issues is, is that uh, within, if you, have, if you draw a boundary, all right, your trade boundary, if your boundary is urban, what you gonna do? It's not easy. There aren't many urban buffer opportunities out there. There, there may be a few, but probably not enough considering all the nutrients that need to be traded on the market, all right? And so that's why retrofitting stormwater control measures has some viability. You have a market out there, you've got new development, all right, often occurring in pretty densely developed watersheds that don't have a lot of agricultural nutrient removal uh, uh, retrofit opportunities. So with, if you have an existing, and, or, and you could, the reason I'm talking about existing versus like existing one, the land's already there. You've already, you already have a pond there. You already have a, a dry pond there. You already have a bioretention cell there, okay? So the land's already dedicated. You don't have a whole lot of new construction because you're just tweaking something that's in, the, it's in place. And what I'm gonna share with you here are some pretty simple things, pretty simple things that can be done. And in some cases, they can even, the changes that you make to your storm or control measure can even simplify the maintenance or at least reduce the frequency of the maintenance. And we'll talk about that specifically as it pertains to dry ponds. And the other thing I pointed out just in the previous slide is that we do have a tool that you can use to predict how much extra nitrogen and phosphorus you're able to remove with your retrofit, all right? And so stormwater control measures, and very importantly, the North Carolina's legislature makes the news sometimes, maybe for all the reasons that we want, but one of the things that they did pass was something that made it very clear to the state officials that they wanted stormwater practices to be eligible for nutrient trading. All right. Now, I was like, praise the Lord. 
All right, because that was a pretty big deal that the, the government, that the highest levels of government, the, gover the governor signed it into law. All right, so it was actually a bipartisan thing that went through. So I was thrilled. All right, so there's certain practices that are particularly easy to retrofit. And, and one of the words you're going to hear me use is, is uplift. It's the idea of taking a practice that just checks all the boxes and then uplifting it to something that does better. All right, so for example, you can take uh, a swale. Standard swale, I mean, they've, we all use them, all right? They're easy to design, all right? And they do generally a pretty solid job of conveying water from A to B. But you could retrofit that swale with a butt into a bioswale or a portion of it becomes a bioswale, all right? The land is already there and you just have to dig out a trench and fill it with an ideal media, all right? That's a retrofit that helps get you more nitrogen. Sand filters, IWS stands for internal water storage. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Wet ponds, I just, I, John Bellotta took me here today. Always good to catch up with him. He always tells me all the amazing things that are happening in Minnesota, and he can condense it in 10 minutes. He's able in 10 minutes, like, I've left like, oh my God, that's amazing. Like in 10 minutes after listening to John, right? And I heard that there's a half a million dollar re a set of research on just improving wet ponds. Well, I love that. We've been, we've been doing that stuff too. I heard you got a cool grant. I can't wait to talk to you about it later. All of that happened in just 10 minutes, John. All right, so wet ponds, and, and this idea of adding a littoral shell filter, you know where we got that? Where's Andy Erickson? Right back there. I saw him give a, a presentation at one of the ASCE conferences. I'm like, hmm, we should do that. You were adding iron shavings, right? So shell filter, and I, honestly, if I had realized this, I, I would have talked more about wet ponds. I'm not. I'm going to actually focus on it. But here's a and couple. Be, this uh, is a pretty popular thing in our state. For, floating wetland for islands. Map, so we floating cool. wetland islands upslope or upstream of your outlet that structure. So cool. And so when these things become pretty developed, you get, I don't know, two to three foot root masses hanging beneath. And it's like having hydro, it is ha not like, it is having hydroponics in your pond right up front of your outlet structure. And we've, and I don't have, I, I didn't include that in today's presentation, but it cleans the water. If, if I say that, if the pond is normal or small, relatively small, these things, definitely enhance your water quality improvement. The pond's really, really big. It's already working well, then maybe it, it doesn't, okay? But this is one of the things that we're looking at as a retrofit to pond. Remember, the pond's already built, and we're just adding this in to try to make it work better for nitrogen and phosphorus removal. All right, but I am gonna spend some time talking about dry ponds. Dry ponds are kind of a persona, I know what, persona non grata, SCM non grata in our state. It's an old school practice. It's a one trick pony. We'll talk a little bit more about them in a little bit but converting them to constructed stormwater wetlands and then bioretention cells have lots of opportunities for retrofitting. And I'll spend some time talking about those as well. All right, but I wanna spend my first bit talking about how we have taken dry ponds and uh, naturalized them or convert them to constructed stormwater wetlands. All right, specifically as we believe in improved pollutant removal, uh, but the retrofit does. So this is your typical dry pond. How many of y'all say, man, that's a good looking practice. Nobody says that about dry ponds. You know, the funny thing is, is think about the number of acres that dry ponds treat uh, in the United States. And I want you to think about the number of acres that green roofs treat in the United States, all right? There's a big difference. There's a lot more dry pond acreage treated than our green roofs. Now, I want you to guess which one has more research articles on them. As a matter of fact, I would say it's almost inversely proportional to the number of acres that each of them treat. Like the number of green roof art research articles is, and then the, the wet dry ponds just like right up here, all right? Because it's not a sexy practice, all right? And so we have a lot and green roofs are. So gr dry ponds are all over the place. So like, yeah, I guess they're out there doing their job. Their job, as I said before, is generally a one trick pony. It rains, the water fills up and they mitigate that peak flow through a hole, an orifice at the bottom, all right? That's what they were put in for. And when we were only really worried about peak flow mitigation in all these different states, including Minnesota, across the United States, dry ponds found their way across our landscape, all right? And the key here is that they have this outlet structure at the very end, at the very bottom. And this, this is the key from a retrofitting standpoint and to not spend a lot of money, all right? And to be able to retrofit this pretty easily, all right? So how well, do dry ponds improve water quality? Well, they have one pollutant removal mechanism that works some of the time, sedimentation. And it works 
some of the time, but we also have resuspension associated with that, right? And then sometimes, I know this is a big, I bet you it is here, it is a big issue in North Carolina, They'll, the engineer would go out and say, where's your water table, all right? Uh, before they build it, before they have like a shopping center. So they go into the woods, they drill some holes, and they find out all the water tables five feet down. Okay, good. Or let's make it eight feet down. Okay, good. We can put a dry pond in here. Then we knock down all those trees, and then we put up a, basically paved, paved paradise and put up a parking lot, right? And then what happens to that water table? It comes back up because we've lost all that evapotranspiration potential that was that was happening, not just potential, well, it's gone, right? And so the water table rebounds, and now all of a sudden your dry pond, which according to that being eight foot down, did have a, a dry bottom. Well, now the water table rebounds another about three feet, and now it's intersecting the bottom or making it somewhat soggy. That's a pain in the butt to mow, okay? That's a pain in the butt to mow. And so all of a sudden you have these people that are beginning to really hate dry ponds because they're really hard to maintain. This is a, a relatively small community between Raleigh and Durham. I think Morrisville has about 12,000 people, and it's got 44 dry ponds, okay? 44 dry ponds, that's a pretty high dry pond per capita. All right, but that means that all of these provide potential opportunity for improvement. And, and I should have switched my side order. This is what happens. This is what happens when you knock down the trees and put up a parking lot. This was dry and it became wet. And it wasn't like it just rained the day before, the water table had rebound. All right, and, and by the way, there's lots of examples of this in dry ponds. So all of a sudden you're saying, hey, look, these things are wetter than we think they should, wetter than they're intended to be. Maybe we can take advantage of this and sort of enhance the design and start converting these things to constructive stormwater wetlands, which have a lot more pollutant removal mechanisms. They employ a lot more, many more pollutant removal mechanisms. All right. So we tried this in two different cities in our state. Any all college baseball fans? Yeah. I know it's probably more of a southern sport because it's warmer in the spring when they play college baseball. I get that. Well, Winston-Salem is where Wake Forest is located, and they're the number one team in America this year. For those of you that are fans, you'll know that two years ago, NC State was on the precipice of winning the College World Series, and then COVID got in the way, and it still is a dagger to this college baseball fan's heart. But that's near to here over there. All right. So we'll talk a little bit about Winston-Salem. I'm going to spend more of this time in Morrisville, which is the place that had the 44 dry ponds with 12,000 people. All right. Well, five of those dry ponds happen to be in this one neighborhood called Providence Place, and we monitored, and what we did is we monitored, this was one of those classic studies. You know, not all the things we get to do are good. Sometimes some of them are okay. Some of them are good enough, but this was like good. So we had two dry ponds next to each other. We had a control dry pond and then a, uh, that we kept as a dry pond. And then one dry pond that started out as a dry pond, we monitored it. Then we converted it, retrofitted it into a wetland. So that's what we did in Morrisville. And in Winston-Salem, we had one dry pond and we converted it into what we thought was gonna be a wetland, but I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. All right, and some of the motivation, I'll come back to the camera in a little bit. Some of the mo motivation here is that when they assess how well wetlands and dry ponds work, they do so by looking at how, uh, what is the, uh, the effluent uh, concentrations of nitrogen and phosphorus that leave the practice, okay? So you can see at the time of the study, this was the effluent nitrogen 1.12, uh, concentration awarded or associated with constructed wetlands, and then the dry pond is 1.65. Is that thing moving? Man. Here we go. This is for you. I'm gonna, this is where the panelists are. I want them. Are you able to catch me? Can you go this far? You good here? The, I'll tell you what, I'm gonna stay right here. So I might be in your way. I'll move. Don't worry, I'll move. <laughs> okay, so you got 1.12, which is a lot lower than 1.65. In fact, the difference in phosphorus is even more pronounced, all right? So right off the bat, the state of Carolina says, well, if you put a wetland in, it's going to release cleaner water for nitrogen, lower concentrations for nitrogen, lower concentrations for phosphorus. And then at the same time, there's also this mechanism here that says, hey, if you put them, if for every pound, we value every pound of phosphorus that gets removed in, in above and beyond some threshold at $302 per pound. All right, and that number is multiplied by 30 years of treatment. In other words, it's a lot of money. That's how much North Carolina values 
nitrogen and phosphorus removal in certain watersheds. You can go to a different watershed, then all of a sudden, instead of it being $302, it's down to 165. That's still pretty good, all right? We'll see how these economics play out in just a little bit. All right, so these are the motivations. We went to the property owner and said, hey, can we do this? They're like, yeah, whatever. They really did like, yeah, whatever, it's fine. And <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not complaining, they said yes. So we monitored it, we had a grad student go out. Um, she actually went to work for Purdue after she left us. And this is what we found before we did any retrofitting, all right? You'll see these, the, the two blues, that's Morrisville. The green is uh, Wake Forest. And this is the typical se uh, sediment concentrations leaving dry ponds, typical sediment concentrations leaving wetlands, ditto for nitrogen, ditto for phosphorus. And what you'll see is that our dry ponds worked like other dry ponds. Now that shouldn't shock anybody because they're dry ponds. But as you, as you take a look and start comparing to the concentrations associated with local wetlands, these were generally higher than what the wetlands were releasing. Not, not all the time, but generally higher. So again, more like, okay, put wetlands in here will likely reduce the water quality. So what we found is that they did not, based upon this, these effluent contracts, they did not appreciably improve nitrogen and phosphorus concentrations coming in. There was a little bit of improvement, but not much, all right? Um, we got a little bit better performance in Winston-Salem. I'll explain why in a little bit. Um, but long story short, we have these water quality thresholds in the state. The dry ponds acted like dry ponds, and dry ponds don't meet those water quality thresholds. All right, so that meant, okay, we have this opportunity now to improve these practices, to let that make them work better, and then we, we did that. So this is how we did it, all right? Here's your dry pond, here's your outlet structure. See that four inch orifice at the bottom, all right? This is what we did. We put an internal water storage type of device. It's really just a riser, it's a, it's a T, okay? That comes out, cap the bottom, and this rows nine inches. We basically flooded the dry pond at a max, at a maximum of nine inches. That's all we did, all right? Well, I shouldn't say that's all we did. We then because we uh, took some storage capacity away, we did have to drill a couple of holes. That was the most expensive part of the retrofit in the outlet structure. So we were able to preserve some peak flow requirements. We did have to do that. And then we planted 1,500 plants, okay? Now all told, this cost us $2,000 if you don't include the payment, uh, uh, the, the time of the grad students that put those plants in, okay? Now, if you do that, and so if you were to, if you were to, you know, put this out in the market, I have a couple of buddies who run maintenance uh, firms. They're like, yeah, we've done that. We've done that for about five thousand for you. Okay, so five thousand bucks, six thousand bucks, somewhere in there, is probably what this would have cost to convert to basically put the put the dry pond in the position to become a constructed wetland. All right, there was no earthwork. That was key. There was no earthwork, which kept the cost low. So this is what the dry pond looked like, all right? See, it's like sticking its tongue at you, like, right? Now I wanna show you, you make a happy outlet structure, all right? Nine inches worth of happiness. And I want you to look at this picture, all right? Nine months later. <laughs> How awesome is that? I like to tell my grad students and any student, anyone that listen that engineers sometimes are like magic. It's like magic. I mean, I'm serious. Boom, nine months later, $2,000, it's magical. I know you might think I'm joking. I kind of am, but I'm kind of not. It's awesome that we were able to do it. Okay, so there's your, that's my goosebump moment of the day. Okay, and here's the day you're like, oh my God, doctor. No, I'm not gonna make you go through that, but this is a little bit easier. You can see the effluent concentrations leaving the dry pond, boom, all right? And then the converted to now wetland. There are eight pollutants. There are statistical differences for seven of them, all for 2,000 um, bucks. If you take a look at a load improvement, these are really fabulous numbers. This is, this is post retrofit, but really like we are thrilled 
A dry pond load removal would be maybe 10% if it's a ni if for nitrogen normally, 71 after this change. Okay, so we were, needless to say, really, really happy about this. Now, Winston-Salem, we had the dry pond. Uh, you can see the outlet structure. And what we did here, you see the orifice. We took that orifice and we filled it with concrete. If you take a look down here, we filled it with concrete. And then um, we put 500 plants in. Now, we do make, I make mistakes. I, I mean, I, I'm happy to admit, I, I'm so happy. I, I'm, you know, I make mistakes. And I made a mistake here. We bought 500 plants, um, but what ended up happening was the water just didn't stay in very long. So all my plants, all 500 of them, almost all of them died because I bought wetland plants. But really what I ended up creating was an infiltration basin, all right? A basin that promoted infiltration. It had nine inches of ponding and that water soaked from the ground in about a day and a half, all right? So it just wasn't wet enough for my wetland plants. But we did have an infiltration basin and that was pretty good. Okay, I was pretty pleased by that. And that cost was about 500 bucks, not that much. Now, if you take a look at the pre and post concentrations here, you will observe there really isn't any difference. Do you know why? Because we didn't change any of the pollutant removal mechanisms. What was, in, what was, it in, in, what was employed to remove the pollutants before the conversion were the very same mechanisms that were available after the conversion because we didn't make it soggy enough, all right? But that doesn't mean it didn't work because what it ended up doing was putting about 50% more of the water in the ground, which means that from a load standpoint, it removed about 50% more of the load by, by basically plugging the outlet structure up. It put 50% more of the load I took it away from the storm drainage network, all right? And that actually was on par with what the load removal was by the, up, by the improvement associated with converting the wet pond or the dry pond in Morrisville, all right? So these are pretty big improvements. Now let's talk a little bit about the, the value associated with the Morrisville improvement, all right? We were in the Jordan Lake watershed. You can see that every pound at the time, Every pound of nitrogen was worth about 108 bucks, and every pound of phosphorus was worth 302. You can see the amount that we would have removed uh, in, in addition over the course. This is of this is a per year basis. You have to multiply that by 30. All right, we spent we'll say up to 10,000 dollars in Jordan Lake. The amount of nitrogen and the amount of phosphorus that would have been able to be sold on the market totaled 300,000 dollars. Now, the neighborhood, they don't know that. <laughs> but, but if they did, if they did, they would be on the market for converting. Imagine that homeowner association. How many of you guys pay homeowner association dues? I do, and I hate it. I hate it. I had these two big trees in front of my, and they, the homeowner association decided they needed to go. And now it's hot in my door in the morning because in my window, my nice breakfast window, I had a nice tree and now it's gone. Cause, and I looked at that tree, it was not dead. Like one of those two trees, I, okay, but both of them? Mm -mm. Anyway, just to, that's an aside, obviously. But hey, even in, in, in another, this is the big one, but look, the next one down, you're still looking at $70,000. $70,000 if you could trade it. Now, look, there's a lot of other things that are going to have to go on here. You have to make sure it, there, it's still working, right? That has to be, the payment's not going to come right away. The payment will be actually probably spread out over the course of about, it is spread out over the course of six years. So there's some other things going on here. But look, in certain watersheds, there is a huge motivation to perhaps make this change. Now, the, I say, and, I, and it is true, this, that the, the neighborhood doesn't know the value it has, but also we would not, we use state funds for this. And so they wouldn't have been able to sell it anyway. All right. Do you know who does know the value of this? Maintenance companies. Okay. I've had many maintenance companies approach me about, hey, Dr. Hunt, do you want to be a partner with, and, and because I'm an extension specialist, where's my man, John? The answer is no, I can't because I'm in the state of North Carolina, I can't.
be a partner with you on this. But I said, can you get something going in Virginia? Because I can go to Virginia and then you can pay me. <laughs> yes, sir. All right. Now I want to show you real quick about how the tool that the state of North Carolina has is able to be utilized by designers to help argue for this conversion. All right. We have a, 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 40, a 400,000, so what, a nine acre, nine to 10 acre watershed, nine acre watershed in a city called Wilson. All right. It's east of us. It has this, this is a standard commercial site treated by a standard size dry pond. And so what you can do is you can go into the snap tool, you enter this, this information in, and you get these numbers, all right? And what I want you to note is how much, what, how many pounds are leaving this site per year? 126 pounds of nitrogen is leaving the site per year. 45 and a half pounds of phosphorus is leaving the site per year based upon this model, okay? Well, then you can take this model and say, all right, instead of, instead of having a dry pond, I'm going to convert it to a wetland. The wetland is undersized, and the model allows you to account for an undersized system, 60% the size it needed to be. So it's a 60% the size it should be constructed wetland. The model will then spit out the following information. So instead of 100 and what was it, 140-something pounds, we're now discharging 79 pounds. So the state has this tool that it lets anyone, it's not, it's not like on a piece of paper, like, look, this is, this is how much, this is how well it's going to work, all right? And it's the state's tool, the state's own tool. So either they're like, our tool isn't good, which they don't want to say, because the tool is pretty good, actually. Or they have to accept that if you make this conversion, you're removing this much more nitrogen and that much more phosphorus, all right? That is a really big deal. I, I can't, and so there it is, the number of pounds of nitrogen and phosphorus that this one conversion for a, a ten, basically a 10 acre or nine acre commercial site would have. And that all has value. In fact, in, in uh, Wilson, which is a much lower threshold or much lower uh, value per pound removed because it's more rural, it's worth about $45,000, all right? But again, if you're gonna spend 5,000 or $6,000 to convert that dry pond, it very well may be worth it. You know who's interested in it? The city of Wilson, the city of Wilson. They're like, we can do this and we can bank our own nitrogen, all right? And we do that, that means we can encourage developers to come in somewhere else and not hold them to the same nitrogen removal threshold that we normally would. It actually makes the city a more competitive place to attract business. Look, no knock on Wilson, but it's not like it's the Twin Cities. It's not like it's Raleigh-Durham. They're competing with a lot of other small and mid-sized cities to get businesses in. And from, that, from their perspective, they're like, hey, if we can make it a little bit cheaper to get someone to move in downtown, we're going to do it. Actually, I applaud them. I applaud them. All right. So there's that. So lots of dry pond opportunities. Now let's talk about bioretention. Now, the, I, I, guys, I tried so hard, and I had some pictures, but you couldn't tell it was you. All right. I, had, I tried to find a picture of me with some Minnesota research colleagues. All right. But this is me. With, I know you've had Dr. Dietz come. Mike Dietz, great guy. Stormwater world is full of great people. Have you figured that out yet? Well, except for the guy from North Carolina. That's right, <laughs> great guy. But I'm like, you come to us, you hear Dr. Gulliver, you hear Dr. Erickson, and like, yeah, bioretention's great, right? Great. And then, but, but, you're, but you're telling me we can make it even better? The answer is yeah, you can, all right? Why would you retrofit bioretention? Because you can make them better, all right? Uh, particularly some of the older designs. A lot of the older designs went in and the design changes, you, you've experienced it here. Um, I was talking with Mike about working with MPCA, was it a decade ago now? Unfortunately, I mean, it was, it was great, right? We talked about improvements to bioretention, right? But I think about all the practices that were designed prior to 2014, 2015. So we came up and I got to watch University of Minnesota beat number one ranked Indiana Hoosier basketball team at Williams Gym. Was that what you, Williams Arena? That's great. It was a great place to watch. I love college basketball. I'm from North Carolina. Of course, I love college basketball. That was a great experience. All right. But think about all the practices that were built prior to 2015. 
They're all older, right? They all have some, they all, they work well for a good lion's share and probably work quite well, but they're all older. We know more about them now, all right? We can make those improvements. We can improve these bioretention cells a bit. And the, the, the number one simplest way to improve a bioretention cell that has standard drainage like this, all right, is to add internal water storage. This is standard drainage, all right, under drain, tiny outlet structure and go, nothing fancy. Under drains right at the bottom, all right? Sort of the old school design. Internal water storage, all we do, we're going from the dark ages, uh, let there be light. It's like Wizard of Oz, boom, boom. We're, we're, in Emerald, we're near Emerald City. Okay, so all you're doing is you're adding some upturn, some way of at least temporarily storing water inside this bioretention cell by adding an upturned elbow. It's really that easy. Sometimes it can be embedded in the media. This is obviously done during construction, but a lot of times they can simply be retrofitted in. The under drain came out, we put an elbow on it and boom. Under drain comes out, we put a T on it, raise it up about, in this case, nine, 10 inches, and you can see the water flowing out during a storm event. It's a very, very simple retrofit, all right? In addition to improving exfiltration, which it absolutely does, okay? And there's some thresholds, like keep it 18 inches away from the surface and sea soil, stuff like that. Um, you can also, it's a very easy retrofit on top of that. So you can put it in, you can, you can retrofit it, you can have it be a new construction. But we, what we did is we monitored one of these um, in a place called Rocky Mount. And I want you to focus on this right here. This is a sandy clay loam underlying soil. That's hydrologic soil group C soil, okay? With uh, upturned elbow, with internal water storage. And we put somewhere between 75 and 85% of the water in the ground on the two cells that we monitored, all right? That's really good, all right? In the ground up in the atmosphere. That is a really big improvement, all right? That one of the things you can do is you can model the how, how much improvement internal water storage gives you. This is using a, an agricultural model that is perfectly designed for bioretention cell. Uh, you, just have to, you just have to change some of the names, but like the inputs are exact, basically the exact same thing. It's called drain mod. It's actually used here in Minnesota. I know I've seen some journal articles on it uh, for shallow water table ag fields. Okay, but what this does is we're able to model bioretention. And this is a bioretention cell installed in hydrologic soil group C soil with three foot of media with a conventional drainage, no internal water storage. And these lines show you the fate of the water. So this is a full size bioretention cell right here. You can see that in a typical full size cell, conventional soils, sea soils, conventional drainage, sea soils, you're putting uh, about 82% of the water is draining out that under drain at the bottom, which kind of makes sense, right? The water flows through bioretention cell, then boom, it's drawn out by an under drain. And only, I don't know, two and a half percent of the water is actually soaking into the ground, all right? Because we're not doing anything to improve the amount of water that soaks into the ground. You run the exact same model, and all you do is you change it from a conventional drainage to an internal water storage zone, and you go from two and a half percent of the water soaking into the ground to about 25% of the water soaking into the ground, all for the price of what? $150, pretty big improvement. And I don't know how you, I don't know if you do this way in, in Minnesota, but in North Carolina, we say, if you put the water into the ground, you don't have to worry about it anymore. We can argue if that's a good thing or not, but that's how the rule works. And I actually used to say it wasn't, and now I'm more in a fan that, yeah, actually I can see that happening. The other thing that it does is you, put water higher up in the soil column, which gives the plant roots more access to it, which means you should be able to improve the amount of evapotranspiration. We have not monitored it, but some colleagues, in fact, I think Bridget Wadzek was the speaker who came after me the last time, she has shown that that does improve the amount of evapotranspiration loss, but just keeping water in, it makes sense, keep water in the plant zone for longer periods of time, you're gonna have more ET loss. All right. Another benefit of doing this is that we look, we did a, a meta-analysis of bioretention cells in and around North Carolina, and you can see that a bioretention cell that has conventional drainage, you do not have denitrification can uh, occur as much. You actually can leak nitrogen 
or nitrate nitrogen out, but when you put internal water storage, you're forcing some saturation and you're actually improving, uh, really improving the amount of nitrate loss. In fact, from a total nitrogen standpoint, it's a really big improvement, all right, to go from a conventionally drained system to an internal water storage zone system from a nitrogen loss standpoint, okay? It doesn't impact uh, phosphorus. You have to be kind of careful with it to, to keep pho the phosphorus numbers essentially in line. But if you start thinking about it, you get a volume reduction associated with internal water storage. You improve the amount of nitrogen that's leaving, just the concentrations are getting lower. That leads to multiple load benefits, all right? And then you can go to the bank and see how much those things are actually worth. So how much does it cost? I had uh, a student work on this, it actually was his PhD, and he said something between 50 and $200. That is a really good deal, okay? I'm gonna show you how good of a deal it is um, using another one of the models that is used in North Carolina called the HyperMod model. It's a bioretention um, hydrology model. And this is the output from that model. All right, I'm gonna show you. So first of all, we're gonna look at a standard configuration that's up here. The purple here, that's the amount of water that drains out. The green is the amount of water that exfiltrates. This is with uh, a B soil, uh, no internal water storage, okay? B soil, no internal water storage, three foot of media. And what you see here is we're discharging uh, 7.8 pounds per acre per year. Not bad, okay, because 17.2 were coming in, all right? So just remember, B soil, no internal water storage. We have tons of drainage, a little bit of exfiltration, uh, and 7.8. All I did was I adjusted that number to, I adjusted no internal water storage to having an internal water storage zone. That's this graph down here, okay? And now look at all the amount of water that's exfiltrating versus which drains. And we go from 7.8 7 pounds of nitrogen per acre per year being discharged to 2.7 pounds per acre per year being discharged. If you take this, if you subtract the difference of 7.8 from 17.2 and 2.7 from 17.2, you can see how much better the bioretention cell with the internal water storage zone does. All right. And it's to the tune of 5.1 additional pounds per acre per year. Okay. Remember, this is a pretty cheap retrofit to get that. So what's that worth? We have a, 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 the city I did my PhD in. Part of my PhD was the city of Greensboro. I put bioretention cells in Greensboro. So if you do that math, 5.1 additional pounds of nitrogen removed per acre year. We'll assume it's a one acre watershed that's being treated for 30 years. That's 153 more pounds of nitrogen being removed. Each pound of nitrogen in Greensboro is valued at $134. I looked it up. That was the last update they had. Okay. That means the total value of that retrofit is over $20,000. And we spent $150 to actually do it. And the engineering on this one is not like a dry pond. Dry pond, you actually have to engineer a little bit to make sure you're still meeting peak flow and whatnot. Here, you're just sticking a T on the bottom of an underdrain and making sure it's not closer than 18 inches to the surface. Voila. Pretty awesome stuff, right? Okay. All for a $200 retrofit. I could, how much time do I have, Andy? Perfect, perfect, perfect. There are a few other options with bio. I wanted to stress that one because that's such an easy one. But media amendments, again, this is an idea that had the idea of using um, alternative or specialized media, something that y'all have been doing up here quite a bit. Uh, our good colleague at the University of Maryland, uh, Alan Davis is as well. He is a huge fan of these water treatment residuals, which is basically what's left over the water uh, purification process before you drink it, okay? And what he shows here is pre and post, let me see if I can get this right, inflow. Okay, this is before, this is before, um, oh crap, I should have looked at this chart a little bit more closely. Okay, let me get this. These two are related. So this one, this is the inflow, that's the outflow before we added water treatment residuals. Things actually got a little bit worse, all right? It's not a, this is for phosphorus, right? Yeah, that's not a shock. You can, you, media, bad media can leak phosphorus, okay? This is before the retrofit. He then went ahead and, and applied some water treatment residuals, tr 
um, tilled them in. This is the inflow and that's the outflow once he applied the water treatment residuals to the same bioretention cell, all right? That is a huge improvement, okay? Huge improvement. It went from actually being worse to being better from a concentration standpoint. And you know how much those water treatment residuals cost? They, that's exactly right. Randy knows they are free. They're free as a bird. Let it skin it. Okay. And this just continues that. And the point is the water treatment residuals, you can get even more removal based upon the types of water treatment residuals and the amount that you're adding. Of course, all that makes sense. Not everything works. Sometimes things are cool and you're like, oh yeah, this is gonna be awesome. This is gonna be a really popular paper. Remember the whole sexy thing? It's gonna be a really popular paper. Let's add mushrooms. Let's add mushrooms to body tension and it's gonna work better. They're gonna thrive. All right, so we actually tried a mushroom, it died. Another mushroom showed up. I think the one we got is the uh, sawgill, Letinus tigrinus, the tiger sawgill mushroom is what we put it. So we put it in there, we inoculated it, we put them in a bioretention cell that used to, uh, we had monitored before the mushrooms came. The mushrooms, the, the mycelia, I just call them mushrooms, they're just mycelia. They're basically in these core uh, waddles, all right? <laughs> the property owner comes to us, he's like, uh, he's a good guy. He's like, um, Dr. Hunt, how long are those things gonna be there? <laughs> I said, oh, they'll, they'll be gone in a year. Okay, okay. <laughs> and anyway, these are the data. You can see the, this is for, we specifically put them in to try to enhance pathogen removal. And you can see that uh, it, it didn't matter. It worked great. Sometimes you're like, hey, dude, it's all working great. Your, your mushrooms, they're not going to, they, sorry, they didn't really help. So sometimes they things work, sometimes they don't. Just not, and that's part of the reason why you do research. That's part of the reason why you have ideas, you think they're gonna work and you test them. Most of the time your hunch is right. Some of the times it's not. All right, so bioretention, got a lot of different retrofit options. Obviously spent the most time on the first two. There are other motivations. The other motivations to up, I say retrofitting, but really we're talking about uplifting. What other motivations do we have? One of the big ones is it's hard to maintain. I talked about that. Another one is, I know this is a blurry picture, I took this from a grad student thesis. I wish I could have gotten the original. That's a pond. That's a classic looking pond. It's the North Carolina Art Museum. They retrofitted it to look like that. So there's an aesthetic, there's an aesthetic benefit and an amenitization benefit associated with retrofitting stormwater control measures. There is flood mitigation benefits associated with certain types of retrofits, all right? Um, and then there are carbon benefits associated with retrofitting stormwater control measures, all right? And these may be, for example, let's say you have a, this is a, this is a vegetated filter strip swale, carbon. This is what, how many of you guys know Tricia Culberson Moore? This is, this was her research at NC State, part of her research at NC Well, actually this is Natalie Bouchard, but Tricia did something somewhere for another type of stormwater control measure. Um, but you can actually take a standard swale, put check dams in it, turn it into a wet swale, and it sequesters more carbon, all right? Those are all benefits. Our DOT is like, this is a great idea because we can make our next rest stop carbon neutral. Seriously, by simply retrofitting our swales in East North Carolina with check dams. I love our DOT. I imagine you guys love MnDOT too. I love our DOT. They do awesome things. Patricia came up with this model that looks at calculating carbon footprints for different, and then you can use this model to project how much improvement you get from a certain type of retrofit, all right? And that, that model is underpinned, uh, is basically the underpinning of this private model now called Carbon Storm that is used to calculate nitrogen, uh, I'm sorry, carbon footprints associated with solar control measures. But we are seeing carbon on occasion being considered as a reason to uplift a stormwater control measure. So here's some closing thoughts. Market forces, oh my gosh, that economics degree, yes. <laughs> I actually really have loved it. I'm an engineer. No one ever confused me with an economist. I'm clearly, hopefully for you, clear I'm an engineer. Um, but they are pushing people to start doing what I would consider to be the right thing. Of course, that's my opinion. But it's not like we're ignoramuses in the field, right? Actually, none of us are, right? Um, some of the common ones, and it's particularly, it's we, I've already, and we can ask to get this in the Q&A, we are, I'm already seeing it with dry ponds. I'm having multiple 
firms come to me about setting up dry pond to wetland conversion banks in the triangle. It's happening right now, okay? Other practices that have some possibilities are floating wetland islands to ponds, the internal water storage to older bioretention cells, internal water storage potentially the sand filters. A key in our state is having that tool that everyone uses that the state has approved to help project or to be used to quantify the improvement. That's actually a really big deal. All right, and then I, I, I want to come, I mentioned this earlier, but I want to come back to it. How many other practices can you make in an urban water? How many improvements can you make in an urban watershed that are this cheap? There really aren't. That, that's not, I'm not trying to put, let's knock something down and build a new stormwater control measure here out of business, because there is room for that, particularly from a flood mitigation standpoint. There certainly is room for that. We need to do that. But man, from a nutrient, from a pollutant removal standpoint, let's just uplift what we've got. And last but not least, as these services, ecosystem services get monetized, this is the tip of the iceberg. This is the tip of the iceberg. Because when we start accounting for or being able to value carbon better or um, evaluate uh, heat island improvement better, and there's actually monetary improvement associated with that, people are more and more going to push for, again, what I consider to be the better stormwater control measure. I really appreciate everyone's attention. Um, it's always great coming up here. I always feel really welcome. Thank you all. And I'll see some of you later. Well, we have time for a couple of questions. Yes, Mike. Mike Trojan, yes. Um, thanks for that. And technology and markets are great, but, and I apologize to my former colleagues at the PTA, but um, for asking this question, but sometimes the regulations get in the way. Yeah. And wondering, for example, we have restrictions here in Minnesota on certain types of infiltration on rapid infiltration, D soils and um, evapotranspiration and things like that and so forth. I'm wondering if you've seen, and you mentioned the SNAP tool, which maybe is one way of getting around some of this, but if you've seen innovative approaches, new approaches um, in the regulatory arena to try to incentivize some of the things that you're talking about. Andy, do you have a list of where the attendees are from? Does all over include North Carolina? Okay. Now I, I just got to be careful. Uh, I think it's a fair, I think it's it's a great question. And when we started this, I looked at this, 2021 is when the real push began. So it's two years later. Um, our version of PCA, which DEQ in, in North Carolina, was fundamentally supportive, but didn't have, they weren't comfortable yet with how they would be able to process what they thought might be a flood of requests, okay? And so there was a, and the staff is sharp. The people who do the nitrogen, they're already doing, they're already doing nitrogen banking. It's happening with wetland conversion, stuff like that. So they're already doing it. So the staff is shop, there just weren't a lot of them. In fact, at the time there was this many of them that was doing it. And so we did have to deal with that. And here we are two years later, when I mean, we had our big unveiling workshop on this in August of 2021, and it's now two years later. And I wish I could share with you the success, but the guy has asked one of them, the one that has has asked me to sit on it. I cannot tell you exactly, but there, I promise there are, there is a success, but it took almost two years. All right. Um, but the month, the scale of money is not insignificant. If you can invest 5,000 and get 200 back, that's part, part of the reason why these firms are sort of sticking with it and sort of really leaning slash encouraging DEQ to approve these things. But there has been, there, there certainly has been a struggle with having everyone be comfortable with the process. Well, like one of the issues, uh, a legit, a very legit one that DEQ brought up was how do we verify that this change is working? All right. Well, stormwater control measures have a really, have something special about them that say a riparian buffer doesn't. 
and it's that who here works for a municipality? Do you require your stormwater control measures to be inspected on an annual basis? That's perfect. Uh, that, that was the answer I needed. That's exactly the answer I needed. That a stormwater control measure is going to be, you don't have to do anything extra special if the municipality says, thou must submit an inspection report on an annual basis, then that inspection report will get submitted. And that's how you know that the stormwater, that this uplift is being retained, okay? And so that was a big hurdle we had to get across. But once DEQ and the, I say DEQ, like it's just a monolith, but once the individuals, they understood, because the people who do the nutrient trading are not the stormwater people. The stormwater people know that there's, they've done audits. They know the communities that tend to be really good about inspecting and those that aren't as strong. And so part of it is, is that they'll improve it, they'll improve it based upon communities that are, that are reliable in their inspection. So city of Durham, for example, I mean, almost all the triangle communities, so Durham, Cary, Morrisville, Raleigh, they're really reliable about having, they can show you, they can show you that maintenance is occurring and inspections are incurring. Those are the places where DEQ is comfortable with now allowing these uplift projects to occur because on an annual basis, they're going to be inspected. That's a key. And, but, and so getting over that hump was a really big one. Great question. Yes, ma'am. Thanks. Um, Sasan? <laughs> I bet you it is. Um, yeah, so I'm curious about the scale of the trading. I know you were talking about watersheds, um, but just, you know, is a city, you know, a pound of phosphorus here, even within um, a defined whatever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. equivalent to a pound? Yes. Yes. So if you could just talk sure. a little bit about the scale of the boundaries how big the boundaries and... are the watersheds yeah. yes and you're exactly right in fact when you go through the mpca guidance they even talk about that in when you're setting the boundaries um they have it such that i wish i could tell you like square miles but half of the city of durham and city of durham has a quarter million people so half of that would be one boundary. So, and if you basically, if the city, Durham actually is divided between two major watersheds. Main Street breaks the two different, it's often the case, right? Between two different watersheds. So the Northern part of Durham, the Northern half of Durham can trade amongst itself. And the Southern half of Durham can trade amongst itself, but it's, but the watershed they can't go to, they can't, go to the next county down, okay? And for the record, that's part of the reason why the city of Durham, for example, really likes this, because they want to see the nitrogen and phosphorus removed in their boundaries. They, they, would, they would prefer to have it done there than have it done in Raleigh, okay? So um, in, I, it bothers me because our counties are smaller than your counties. How many counties do you have in Minnesota? 80, we have 100, and our state's probably half the size of Minnesota. Or maybe generous, it might be less than half, right? So our counties are generally smaller, but but you're generally seeing trading opportunities within, say, a half a county. All right, there's a couple of cases where it may be a county, county and a half. It should go east, and there's bigger ag counties, but the trading areas I'm thinking of are roughly a half a county in size. Hopefully, that helps you guys a little bit. Um, maybe we'll take a, a question from online. Yeah. Also, uh, this is from Jane Cleary. They ask. Hey, Jane. I'll assume that they say hi. Yes, I'm good. Uh, what are the long-term clogging for the Winston-Salem infiltration basin retrofit? Are we worried about long-term clogging? Yes. Yeah. Uh, in a generic way, we should worry about clogging this particular site. One of the advantages about taking existing sites and retrofitting them is that the watersheds tend to be stable. All right, not always, but tends to be stable. So we would worry about clogging if they start digging that watershed up, um, which obviously could happen at some point. But right now, uh, it's saying that again, that's a benefit of taking existing practice because they're in what would be expected to be a stable watershed to begin with. But that's certainly something that one would want to consider. Okay, so good question. I, uh... 
One more online. Okay. Okay. This is from Jane as well. Okay. Uh, they ask, can you elaborate on quote, be careful with phosphorus with internal water storage zone? Oh, sure. So you might remember about where you put your internal water storage and how close to let that water, the internal water table, okay, elevation, get to the surface. And the reason is, is that phosphorus, our observation is that the phosphorus is getting trapped in the top 18 inches or so. Eventually you could go deep, it could be deep. But the reason it's important is that if you exposed trapped phosphorus to long-term saturation conditions, uh, it's likely that that phosphorus will disassociate with the soil and be flushed out like a toilet, all right? And so that's why it's particularly important to keep 18 inches. And that was, we used to have it be a foot and we dropped it down to 18 inches. Um, it didn't really matter much at all from how well the internal water storage zone worked, but we felt more comfortable with that from a phosphorus removal. So basically we're gonna keep the phosphorus up here so it doesn't get disassociated. Okay. That, that is a, that what, a fix to that though, sorry about that, is if you wanna come in and sprinkle your water treatment residuals and till it in, you'll get another lifetime of, of performance from your bioretention cell. Technology is helping us. I know maybe not all of us are AI people, I'm not actually, <laughs> but there are technologies are helping us that are going to really, I think, preserve the long, the longevity of these practices. Do I have time for one more? Uh, yeah, I've got one here from Randy. We'll let you finish. Okay, thanks. Um, so it's two questions about your conversion of dry ponds to wetlands. Sure, great. Uh, one is, do you have problems because you've created a really good mosquito breeding site? Huh? And the second is, what would happen if instead of wetland plants, you put in the appropriate trees and turned it into a small forest? Okay, both fabulous questions. Uh, and I have answers for you. Number one, as long as it is maintained appropriately, your wetland, it can be mosquito resistant, okay? Um, it's all about providing habitat for mosquito predators. All right, that's the key. And I know this is going to sound, how many of you guys are parents of teenage children? Or you've had them at one point, you're like, thank God that's over. So, are there teenage children? No, so, <laughs> yeah, unleash those children in there and then eat all the mosquitoes. So what happens is you actually keep your wetland maintained in a state of suspended adolescence. And you're like, that sounds like the worst idea ever. But like that, but as long as you don't let the trees take over, all right, and you don't have ponded, you don't have long-term ponded water with a tree canopy and you don't let cattails take over, um, then you are likely, and we actually have a planting palette that is our mosquito resistant planting palette for constructed wetlands. Okay, and, and we, I can go way deep into this. This is something that we did some studies on about, oh my God, two decades ago, but, but they don't have to be an issue. And if they're maintained right, they're not in, I say not, it's, it sounds, they're hardly ever an issue. Okay, but that's a great question. The second one is what if you just let trees grow? I, if I just focused on dry pond conversion, I would have talked about, and, and not done the bioretention, I would have talked about naturalization. And what we do there is you don't create nine inches of storage, all right? You create a couple of inches and that's it because you really do want the water to soak into the ground. But when you naturalize these systems, they work a lot better. They work a lot better. We've studied that for DOT. They had old sediment basins that were supposed to be converted to dry ponds. They were initially, but then they became overgrown. And then there might have been an entity saying, you need to cut those trees down. And DOT says, should we do it? Well, we monitored the wooded dry ponds and they worked way better, not as good as the wetland did, but way better than a standard dry pond. And so now DOT, think about it, a lot of things that they build are in the middle of nowhere. Right, so like, hey, if you want to let your dry pond grow up, as long as you maintain the outlet structure and make sure it's not, its function's not impaired, then you can let them go up and they do work better. It's a great question. Hey guys, thanks for everyone showing up online. I appreciate everyone being here. I know we're gonna take a small break and then we'll come back. Yes, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> so, uh, Sorry. so thank you. Thank you for that lead in, Bill. Uh, so uh, first thing I wanna say is that Bill is giving us uh, another seminar on Roman infrastructure. Uh, at three o'clock right here. And so you may want to tune in online or um, show up. Uh, in addition, we will take a five minute break and then we'll come back.
with a panel discussion. Don't go away. Just take a break for five minutes. Thank you very much. Welcome back to the Minnesota Stormwater Seminar Series. My name is Andy Erickson. It's my honor and privilege to moderate our panel discussion on the topic today. I will introduce our panelists and ask for their relation to the topic. I'll thank Bill for giving us the keynote and setting the stage. Uh, and then I'm actually going to start on my right, your left, at the far end of the table with our first panelist, Anna Bosch, who is the Stormwater TMDL Liaison in the Municipal Division of the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Anna, from your experience and perspective, how do you relate to today's topic? Thanks, Andy, and mm -hmm. thanks, Bill, for super fascinating talk. Um, I came in here with one sort of thought, but your talk kind of went the other direction. So I'm not sure if I should talk about like water quality trading in Minnesota is a lot different than what you are talking about. Um, so from the Minnesota perspective, I come into it, um, there has been a ag urban partnership forum uh, meeting in 2020. And as a part of that, the agency and Board of Water and Soil Resources and the Department of Agriculture decided they wanted to have further conversations specifically about water quality trading um, partnerships in Minnesota. And so there was a pilot project in the North Fork of the Crow River watershed. In 2021, there was a series of meetings with different stakeholders. Um, and as part of that, we updated our water quality trading guidance in Minnesota to incorporate stormwater as a possibility more explicitly than it had been discussed before. So that's how I got roped into this topic. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Anna. Thank you very much. Our next panelist is Randy Nepresh, who is the vice chair for the National Municipal Stormwater Alliance and also continues to serve as part of the Minnesota City's Stormwater Coalition, formerly of Stantec and Bonastru. Uh, Randy, from your perspective and experience, how do you relate to today's topic? In multiple ways. Um, so first I wanna thank the Saffle folks, Andy, John, and John. It's always a treat to come here, especially when Bill is the speaker. I um, also wanna wish everybody a happy solstice. Um, many years ago, I used to hang out with people who knew how to celebrate pagan holidays, but now it's just stormwater folks and we don't know what to do. Um, so, uh, I've, I've worked with this state level coalition of about 130 of the MS4 permittees, and we used to have high hopes for trading, um, and particularly this exchange between urban and ag with the notion that, um, removing pollutants in the urban situation was really expensive and doing it on the ag side was a whole lot less expensive. And if we could figure out ways to do trading, wouldn't that be delightful? Um, in some contexts, it has worked out. In the context of the MS4 permit, it has not. So the MS4 permit is interesting in multiple ways, but it's non-numeric, it's BMP based, uh, for trading, you need numbers, you need uh, numeric permit requirements, you need to be able to exceed them and then trade those exceedances. And the legal standard on the MS4 permit side is maximum extent practicable rather than numeric. So it's the best you can reasonably do, uh, which means figuring out when you've met the permit requirements is damn near impossible. Um, so then you don't really have anything to trade. With So we, the cities, multiple folks, uh, but also the PCA, took a couple serious runs at trying to do trading, and after a while sort of gave up. This is before your time. Marco, Marco would know about it and have a rueful expression. Um, with all that said, um, trading on the, on the SCM scale happens in the urban environment in a way that hasn't been discussed at all today which is um, stormwater utility fee credits. So um, you have a, a new project, perhaps a redevelopment on a site. Um, the stormwater utility fee for the site, um, unless it's residential, so this is mostly commercial and industrial uh, institutional sites, the utility fee is based on no treatment 
And if the property owner is willing to put in significant treatment, run the calculations, actually show that their treatment has significantly reduced both the volume of water and the pollutant loads of leaving the site, the city will on occasion provide utility fee credits. So it's a financial incentive which is what we're after on the trading side. The, the poster child for this in Minneapolis is the Murphy Warehouse, um, where they essentially knocked their stormwater utility fee down to just about nothing uh, and had a seven year payoff on a really significant um, site installation cost. Um, it's, it's a good story. You can find out about it on the web. So that's my two cents. Very good. Thank you, Randy. Our third panelist uh, is Rebecca Hauga, who's the who is a project manager at WSB Engineering. So, Rebecca, from your expect, experience and perspective, how do you relate to today's topic? Thank you, everyone, for having me today. Um, I represent quite a few MS4 communities within the metro area and even outside the metro area, as well as have worked for a couple MS4 communities and have been working to try and figure out ways to do this for many years, have had meetings with the MPCA and a couple of communities trying to make this work, have had a couple developers willing to do projects over and above to try and get that credit and get utility fees reduced. And so, and I also sit on the Minnesota City Stormwater Coalition. Uh, thank you, Randy, for your many years of wonderful <laughs> service there, where we are constantly trying to figure out better ways to improve Minnesota's stormwater program. Very good. Thank you, Rebecca, and thank you, panelists, for serving. Uh, I won't ask for Bill's relation because he gave us the keynote and set the stage for today's discussion. So now we are ready for questions. So what questions do we have from the audience, either in person or online for our panelists today? One moment. Yeah, my name's Nigel Pickering. Um, I've looked at a lot of different uh, water quality trading systems in the US and there's very few that actually function well. Some of them just trundle along, some of them fail. And probably the one that's worked the best is uh, in the Connecticut River, where it's uh, nitrogen trading point to point because it's all quantifiable. So what is, my question is, what are the criteria for trading that make it work? What are the factors that we need to consider? I mean, I can go in to start. Okay. Having a reliable assessment tool that everybody respects is key. Okay, so North Carolina, I talked about this, I showed a couple of pictures of the SNAP tool. It's used by, it's used to assess nutrient loading or be, nutrient loads being discharged from developed parcels. Okay, it's used all over the state, the city, cities, counties, state, private sector, all use it. So having a model that can be used to assess the impact of the bump up or the uplift is key that's number one and when that's when that model is not present and that model has to be able to account for undersized practices okay in north carolina we have if you put in if you put a practice in to begin with it's almost always guaranteed to be full size at least on paper mm -hmm. all right designed per spec on paper, but the, having a model that allows undersized practices, because when you convert from a dry pond, say to a wetland or even a dry pond to a pond, the footprint of the dry pond is often smaller than that of, of what a full-size wetland or wet pond would need to be. All right. So having a model that everyone trusts that allows and accounts for undersized practices. Secondly, you have to have a good to trade. And that sounds kind of ridiculous, but you have to have uh uh, a um, a TMDL, all right. Talked about quant. Randy talked about having something quantifiable. You have to have a quantifiable uh, good to trade, and and basically having that amount be capped effectively. All right. There's basically some capping that has to occur that the amount of nitrogen that's allowed to be discharged into a stream is set at some level. All right. So that as people are taking one land use out of production, agriculture, and putting in an urban land use, 
there's got to be some mechanism and some value associated with that nitrogen, phosphorus, sediment, whatever is being traded. All right. Um, and then I think another thing that's key in North Carolina, two other things, is you've got to have people that are willing to take a risk. Okay. Same would be true. I mean, this is everywhere, right? People, you have you have to have, including the government, all right, to try to be willing to give a trial. Um, and you have to make you have to ensure that whenever the trade is done, that the good that is promised is delivered. All right. So those are those to me are the key elements to an effective trading program. So this can be it's got to be some accounting tool that says, yeah, you've made this. It's still working. We're able to pay. The payment structure also has to be viable for people. It has to be enough money in it. Okay, there's six things. That's a start. <laughs> so start. Analysts, what other? Well, I would agree with everything that Bill said. We, I mean, we have had some sex success in Minnesota with point-to-point -point trading for wastewater and point non point trading for wastewater. It's just we haven't extended all the lessons to stormwater yet. But I agree with there has to be some risk taking because there's a lot of resources required on both the agency side as well as whoever is interested in the trade. There's some work that has to be done on the front end before you can get something going. Bill also also used a magical phrase um, as as pessimistic as I sounded on the MS4 side. Um, where I'm actually a little optimistic, hard to believe though it may be, um, is TMDLs. And, and TMDLs, the, the linkages between TMDLs are still relatively new here, um, but the TMDLs are more numeric. So now we have cities reporting pollutant load reductions, estimated, God knows, but still. Um, and so I would have some hope there uh, as we learn how how to um, how to work with the numbers and hopefully possibly develop a trading system. And we we can rely on Anna because she's the PCA's TMDL MS4 liaison. Um, so it's all it's all going to depend on Anna. <laughs> no pressure. No, no pressure. pressure. Right. That was a good question, by the way, Nigel. Any other thoughts on that? Because I have a follow up. Okay, so I want to I actually want to touch on uh, something Bill said in that answer. And that's uh, thinking about perpetuity. So you said the good has to the promised good has to be delivered. My question is, how do we ensure it stays? If we're trading for nutrient reductions? How do we ensure that we're going to get that credit, quote unquote, in perpetuity, we've seen rain gardens that are built in neighborhoods, New homeowners come in, they're like, I don't want this thing, and they fill it in. What would you say to that? And that, that comes from even the MS4 permit, not even necessarily trading, but thoughts on that? Inspection, inspection, inspection. Yeah. That is the, that the one thing that, that if an engineer or a landscape architect puts his or their stamp on something, okay, they are promising, and, and that the city says, okay, you're delivering this, all right, and then the city says, okay, we're gonna make sure this is getting inspected on an annual basis, all right? That really is the key. Now, there has to be, the probably part of that, the, there is a cost to trading, all right? So the overall, so I, I talk about $300,000, you invest 20,000, blah, 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 or $50,000, you invest five. Well, some of that extra, some of that profit, so to speak, needs to be invested in probably people that will, in addition to having the annual inspection, but basically hold the property in case, in case something comes out of compliance, you've got to, you've got to make the property owner put it back into compliance. But you have an annual opportunity with inspect, and that's what makes stormwater different from again. We do buffer restorations. People are not riding around checking on buffers every year. All right. So stormwater has a really big advantage in that in that realm. Well, and we we do. Sorry. Okay. Um, 
we we have these accounting systems built into the existing point to point trading systems and point to non point trading systems um sugar beets are one of the examples i can think of where they check on something like 10% of the practices each year these are kind of consulting contracts to die for um mostly because of the perpetuity element um but we we take that into account and we check for it in the in the stuff we've done already and then uh the inspections that that permittees are doing on the stormwater side work out well in this context also sorry that's okay i was just going to mention along with the inspections having a plan in place if the system fails and doesn't continue to meet their requirements. Mm -hmm. And so having some kind of safety net for that, um, that tends to happen a lot when people try newer systems and find out after a few years that this is not as effective. So then making sure that everyone's working together to come up with a new plan to continue to meet those requirements and see those reductions. And I, the only other thing I would add is that there is the expectation that there's agreements put in place before these things happen. So this is all spelled out and who's doing what and who's responsible and the inspections and monitoring and things like that. It's not like you just throw something out there and pluck things out of the air. Nope, it stays, right? Yeah, and I think that's a, that's a great point. I want to mention that. There are examples out there where language is on property deeds and other contracts and agreements that kind of protect these things so they can't just disappear and, and all of a sudden you paid for something that's not there anymore. So what other questions do we have for the panelists? I'll give Mike and then we'll go to Ben. Um, you may have already answered this question, but um, I go back to Marco with the origin of trading in Minnesota. And the thing that I think one of the things that always kept getting in the way was the stupid trade ratio. We could never get it below two and a half and it was usually over three. And I don't know, but have we made progress in that or what's it going to take to get the non-stormwater people to trust a, a ratio that's one and a half or maybe even less? That's for you guys. So the <laughs> current trade ratios in the guidance right now are 2.614 non-point to point. And for stormwater uh, trades, it was 2.1, just because unless we you can get and you can reduce the ratios if you have better quantitative numbers yeah. but this is if it's all based on modeling that's the ratios we're working with right now with the possibility of reducing with more information but so that's wow. the current picture and 1.1 to 1 for wastewater because they're measuring things coming out of the pipe it behaves better than stormwater yes, it does. god knows what's what what are trade ratios are you working with in north carolina I'm going to make him mad if I tell him the answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. We're happy with that. I mean, it's, it's, it's for stormwater, it's effectively one to one. <laughs> <laughs> Mike's, 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 re Mike's retired. He just doesn't get mad at all anymore. But, but the reason is, is that there's level in the accounting tool, there's levels of conservatism built in. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so it really isn't. I mean, I guess it is and isn't, but it's not two point. It's not two point one to one. There's probably about twenty to thirty percent conservatism, maybe one point two, one point three to one. But from an exchange standpoint, it looks like it's one to one. And I would I would comment also that I think um, to some extent, particularly the point to non point side, um, the the trading ratio is partly based on a spectacular lack of experience. Right. Um, and, and we can hope that as we do more of this and work out the bugs and actually demonstrate the stuff can work, the trading ratio can come down. Let's hope. And, that, and that's why we do these kind of things. We have these conversations. We try to learn from others. We bring the best knowledge in and we try to adapt and, and improve our systems. So can I other thoughts on that? Yeah. I'm just basically going to reaffirm Randy's last point because the stuff I talked about are things that we have, the model is able to calculate. You guys know about regenerative stormwater conveyance. Okay. That's a practice that has not been as well monitored. Okay. And we actually don't have, we don't, we, we have no set design standards for that. They're, they're floating out there, but 
it, we didn't go down this, we didn't go all the way down the street, but it was floated the idea of putting an RSC in, in a gully, and this, the committee didn't have to do it. But they said, well, we want to stabilize this gully and it's going to move nitrogen and phosphorus. And they went, there was a discussion with the state on that. And the state took a very conservative line as to how well it would work. And so I, the reason ours is close to one-to-one -one for the things I showed you is because there's a lot of research. There really is. We have a lot of research that backs up the model in those areas. But the, if the research is not present, they are going to have and for all I know, that number could have been 2.1 to 1. My, my personal suspicion is that you talked them into it. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of money. And that did, it did not happen. It did not happen. Do you have questions from online? Yes. This is one from Jeff. They ask, does the state of Minnesota or North Carolina incentivize agricultural activities to reduce pollutant loading from fertilizers and animal waste? Well, in Minnes the only thing I would say in Minnesota, there is the uh, uh, w oh, there's a water quality certification. Yeah, the water quality certification program that farmers can enroll have their um, operation certified, and they can get um, you know suggestions and in improvements they can make to their operations, and then they get a certification. And I assuming there's some funding mechanisms that go along with it. It's not my area of expertise, but that's the only. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there is, there, there are grant programs. Um, there are programs, especially with buffers. There's a lot of programs that if you promise to take the swath along a creek out of production, that they will that there's state funds that they will pay you to do that. That's and that has been an extraordinarily successful program. In fact, you remember I showed you the numbers in the Jordan Lake watershed at one point it was like three hundred dollars per nitrate for phosphorus bound and a hundred for nitrogen, but in other watersheds they were nowhere near that high. It's because so much of the potential buffered land has been buffered. All right, that's how successful the program was. So now they're like, oh, how are we going to get rid of more? nitrogen and phosphorus and that's why they're that's the particularly hotbed for the, the reason like that's basically the reason i gave my talk okay so um there is that and then east north carolina they also give money for um oh uh, obviously i'm an, you can see how much of an ag guy i am <laughs> uh, uh controlled uh controlled irrigation it's when they stick planks and ditches and flood fields all right there are but there's also they you know what they used to get money for that they don't do that anymore because the farmers make money like it's actually better for crops so now they don't give i believe i'm right about that they don't give money to promote that anymore because the market is so the market has pushed them in that direction but yeah there are money there are grant programs i'm sure minnesota I would. I don't have a ton of money in my wallet, but I would bet all of it <laughs> that Minnesota has the same general type of programs to promote improvements in ag land. As long as we're on the topic, um, I have I have one gripe in this area, but also a, a piece of advice for those who look at ag certification programs, which is that um, the folks that run the programs almost always list the number of acres that are enrolled in the program. And the number of acres is, tends to be really impressively large. Um, and what they hardly ever say, and what you should always ask if you have the opportunity, is what percentage of the total land in agricultural production does that number of acres represent? And almost invariably, the percentage is um, minuscule um, small percentage. Um, so that's worth paying attention to. Other thoughts on that? Can't resist a cheap shot at egg. That's right. Do we have, we took a couple from in-person. Do we have another one online? Yeah, we do. Uh, this one is quite long, so bear with me. 
<laughs> this is from Noah Gallagher. Who is in the best position to be one of those fo- first few risk takers and begin the process in areas that lack well-established credit markets? Should some governmental authority, like a watershed district or city, act as a market maker or preemptively buy up credits from the new BMP practices that can later be sold in order to add li- liquidity, no pun intended? Or is it better for two private parties to approach the government with a trade already lined up? Wow. I do know that there are some cities within the state who have been looking very closely at how to get into this. Their challenge has been the MPCA rules and how to figure out ways to work with the MPCA to get kind of some models going and be guinea pigs to try and do this. So there is work being done. You're just not hearing a lot about it yet. Mm -hmm. We're actively looking. Well, not super actively. (laughs) Sorry. Almost actively. (laughs) You're actively breathing. (laughs) Oh, shit. It's on our list that we, I mean, we are looking for, we would like to sort of do a tabletop exercise with some possible projects so we can sort of game this out. Because, I mean, the concern is putting something out there and it completely and utterly fails. It'd be nice if we could run a little tabletop before we get too far over our skis. Uh, That being said, my understanding is that we are adding a staff person specifically for water quality trading that's great wow that's great so how what? okay um how how far did you get in the north fork of the crow well, we pilot had, project we had some well so the point of the pilot project was to ask questions and get more information not to actually put something on the ground so okay people's definitions of pilot projects are different um <laughs> but so we did have several conversations we uh, went, uh, there were continued conversations with a couple of municipalities, and then one of them ran into a zebra mussel infestation, which sort of torpedoed some of their yeah. efforts. So, but we're still, it's, it's not, we're still working on it. Okay. Um, it's a related thought. The first one in North Carolina was done by a city, that the first one was approved was done by a city. I talked about city of Wilson and they had very forward thinking leadership and who attracted people who are also very forward thinking. And they are in the midst of a major downtown redevelopment. They're, they're located about 50 minutes east of the triangle and things are more, I'm sure there's some equivalent here. That's a lot more affordable there. And they're trying to basically, how many are familiar with NASCAR? It's another sport for North Carolina. (laughs) So basically Wilson understands it can draft off the triangle, right? And so as it is drafting, it's competing against other communities. I hope to God there's, I really do hope none of them are watching right now. (laughs) Uh, but, But they realize that this is our opportunity to make us more attractive, okay? Um, and so that was the first one that went through. And the other ones that I have seen that I'm not really tend to involve large landowners, okay, who have a lot of potential assets that if they went into the market can make a lot of money. Sure. And so that'd be pri- so private entities and people who work for those large landowners. There we go. That's a great question. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that? All right. Um, questions from the audience? Yeah, I thought Ben had one. Yeah, I think um, you got really close to this, Bill, but this is kind of a question for everyone. I was just curious where the numbers come from for the phosphorus and nitrogen, uh, just for the value of removal, because it seemed like you had a pretty big range. And I've seen numbers even up in the thousands for phosphorus removal, which I think is based on the cost of new construction. Um, uh, of BMP. So I'm just curious, since that seems like a really important part of any sort of trading system, unless you're just doing pounds for pound or something like that. But it seems like, you know, as Paula said, a pound here is not the same as a pound there. So I'm just curious 
how those, how you got those numbers and for the Minnesota people, how you have or would do that. It, when you meet my numbers, just point of clarification. The, the dollar, the how dollar much value. Is worth? How much is every pound worth? Yep. Okay. The state of North Carolina arrives at those numbers. I used to help them with it. Okay. And what it comes down to is, again, under, operating under the TMDL, there's a certain amount of nitrogen that essentially has to be removed or transferred or whatever. Okay. And then they look at uh, what is currently being used to get those nitrogen pounds reduced. Buffers are really cheap. All right. So, and, and so they, they look at, okay, so that's, let me step, step back. The set, maybe the first piece is how do we know how well a buffer works? All right. How do we know how well a, a wetland, a rural wetland works? That is based upon lots and lots of monitoring. We couldn't be doing this program 20 years ago. There's just so much monitoring has occurred in our confidence in how well a wetland, a buffer, a dry pond converted to wetland, a bioretention cell with IWS, like so, so much research has occurred that, that underpins how well it works from a nutrient removal standpoint, okay? So then how much, how much, okay. And so then you put a, a buffer in, that buffer is credited with removing X number of pounds. How much did that buffer cost to remove that number of pounds? The state keeps track of it. And really what happens is you have private entities put in bids and this, the private entity based upon the state's numbers says, if you give us X amount of money, we will give you X number of pounds, all right? And so the state keeps track of that and that's what it uses to set those, those, those values. And, and so what happens, that's why it's very much watershed dependent and mentioned back again that all the buffers in one watershed, it's all already been buffered. So now like, ah, uh, what are we going to do? And what we're going to do sometimes is building constructed wetlands, which is a good practice in rural, but it costs more than buffers does. And so all of a sudden, the, the cost per pound removal goes up. And that's why you see the differentiation in the different watersheds in North Carolina. It's, like, it's a sign of how developed are they and how much how much ag opportunities are left? How many ag opportunities are left? Okay. What about the urban areas? That yeah, was the question. Urban areas, they're all based on ag. But, uh, here, here's, but, no, no, but here's why. Because do you know how expensive it is to put, uh, the answer is I know you know. Like it's really expensive to say, okay, we're going to take out that parking lot and we're going to put in a, a wetland, all right, or pick some BMP. It's a very expensive proposition, all right. And if and, and this is actually a point I was going to eventually get to. I'm just going to get to it now. That if you if you are if you have really big boundaries and the ag sector is available, it's very rare for trading. It's very rare that someone's going to go urban because it's never is it's not competitive financially. It's always cheap almost always cheaper to go ag with one exception retrofitting existing stormwater control measures because you don't have to buy any land the land's there almost all the construction's been done so why do i go there that's why our stuff is so much cheaper it's so much cheaper so once a lot of those start getting put in the ground you know what's going to happen to that value that 300 dollars a pound it's going to go down I know my friends at home aren't going to want to hear that, <laughs> but it's going to take a little bit. I mean, there's going to be, there, basically firms are getting into it right now. are going to have, I think, a two to three year heyday. Other thoughts on this, on that question from the panel before we take another question? Yeah, I've got, not surprisingly, uh, <laughs> I have some thoughts on it, um, which is, uh, it, it doesn't really answer your question at all. You'll be thrilled to know. <laughs> but. The <laughs> you invited me. Um, <laughs> the arguably the biggest piece of news today is is how inexpensive and cost efficient retrofit of existing SCMs can be. That's a huge piece of news. And yet, with that said, um, this whole deal of cost efficiency is seems to have limited value in terms of actually directing uh, 
construction, regulation, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the example I can think of, and, and this, this has been playing out on the street sweeping side of things, spectacularly cost efficient. We're, we're removing phosphorus for less than $100 a pound. I mean, that's crazy. Um, we're, we have rain garden programs that are based on um, $5,000 per pound um, to remove phosphorus. And yet, we're still doing those things. We have a regulatory hook when new projects are done and big redevelopment is done. We don't have the regulatory hook on the retrofit side. Maybe this is the potential for internal trading. Well, so I Isn't that interesting? Well, no, uh, but because the whole yeah. time I was watching Bill's presentation, I'm like, well, we can do this now and it's not trading. <laughs> I mean, if an MS4 is improving one of their BMPs, you can take credit for that. Like that's the intention in the new annual e-service will be that, did you make an improvement to this? Check the box and you can change your number. That's the plan. Oh. I mean, it's not- Breaking news, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> that's why you invited me. I appreciate that. <laughs> I really well, right. There's why would you, you can't, can't trade? Well, you yeah. why would you trade it? Yeah, like, yeah, you want, you it, want it? You yeah. need it. So, but before the lecture I gave today, we talked about improving stormwater control measures based on that. So you've got a problem with the practice. You're going in to repair it. Okay, why don't you improve it while you're there? And so, at NC State, NC State has. 170 stormwater control measures on campus. And th th we really started it there. That was th they'd have most of them work, by the way, but some of them don't. <laughs> and so, and the one, so, but NC State, I give them a lot of credit. They go and they try to fix them and they kept trying to fix a bioretention cell that just was broken. And it's because the sediment was coming in. Someone asked about law. Oh, it was Jane. Jane. Okay. <laughs> but what we talked about is okay, this is not going to work let's adjust our practice to something that would. And we, and then the university says, well, we got these dry ponds that they hate maintaining. I said, well, and they really are awful. They were unsightly. They were hard to maintain. Um, and so I said, well, why don't you think about turning that into a, oh, it's a good idea. We'll do some bioretention. So we started, and I said, and when you report to the state, how many pounds of nitrogen you're moving, you can change your number and bump it up. Oh yeah. And so that's how, that's when we started this. It was all about just improving your practices so you can report a better number because you have to, you're going to improve them anyway. And it wasn't, it was then when the market came out, I'm like, oh, oh man, we can take this to a new level. But we've, so the, the situation that comes to mind is a city um, has a good size, I mean, I can think of one city where this has taken place. They had a good sized park. They could put in a really big infiltration facility and it could, I mean, they had a, a kind of new development standard um, and that one installation achieved so much reduction that it was the equivalent of applying the new development standard for like a quarter of the city. <laughs> and yet, I don't know where you guys fit in. We we have a we have a complex regulatory environment here. So watershed districts come into the mix. The city then goes out and does um, a road improvement project, and we have um, state standards for what you have to do with with road improvement and new impervious, et cetera, et cetera. But the watershed district also has standards. In this particular case, the city said. Well, this new road project is pretty close to this huge infiltration thing. We're not going to do anything on the new road project because we did so much over here. And the watershed district said, nah, you are going to meet <laughs> the new stand, the new project or the, the redevelopment uh, road standards anyway. So the, the concept of internal trading didn't work at all in that case. Um, I don't know where you guys, but, uh, um, but we need to, you know, if we're going to make this work, we need to change some of that. I think that happens in more and more cities around the state where 
roads get designed and they have these little tiny infiltration basins that aren't very effective. They get filled with salt and sand throughout the year, whereas you have a new development or a redevelopment going in where they're willing to go over and above. Let the municipality mm-hmm. take the credit for that extra mm-hmm. versus having all these little BMPs that are kind of a maintenance nightmare when you work for a city, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have you guys had one of these lectures on economies of scale of stormwater? We have not That's talked about economies one. of scale. Let me know you want me to come back. I'd love to come. I love coming up here. What are you doing in August? Football season. <laughs> Football season. There. Oh, no. Invite him in January. Hockey. 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 Okay. Ice fishing with Dr. Gull- Gulliver. Uh, other questions. Do you have more questions online? All right, go ahead online. Yeah, this one asks... The cost of water quality improvements always seems to fall on the regulated communities. Trading provides a mechanism for permitted entities to pay for cleanup of pollutants that are not responsible for discharging. Has anyone found effective ways to incentivize improvements without the financial burden falling entirely on those who fall under the regulatory umbrella of MPDES? Not yet. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that was that was the sad tale that I told at the beginning. That's been my experience so far. <laughs> it's something like what's... a lot of MS4s deal with where the water that's coming into their community is from areas that aren't held to the same requirements, but yet they have to treat it and trying to figure out mechanisms to be able to afford that treatment for water that they have no control over. We haven't quite gotten there yet. Hopefully someday we will. The only thing I would say is that perhaps, right, it's not their discharge, but, you know, doing a stream bank restoration might be cheaper than installing something within the city limits. So that would be the one trying to find some sort of economic benefit out of Mm -hmm. doing an alternative practice like that. Honestly, trading happens when something's compelled mm-hmm. i mean that's yeah i don't know what to say you, you there has to be something that has there has to be a compelling right you know I, yeah and so i you can see other people basically it doesn't have to be on an, an ms4 can engage other people farmers are compelled all right so well, whoever engaged in a trade at least initially who's going to promote it is going to be someone that's going to be compelled. And then someone maybe who's not compelled that can take financial advantage would join it. But you've got to have at least one partner be compelled for this to happen. There's this, I hadn't thought of this example until, until just now, but it shows how sad the whole situation really is perhaps, which is, the MS4 permit is based on the conveyance system. So there are portions of city systems or lands or waters within a city that are not part of the stormwater conveyance system at all. So a few examples. One is a city can go in and do in lake treatment, flocculation, alum, whatever. The, it can be done in, in natural um, natural lakes. It can also be done in constructed stormwater ponds, in which case it is part of the system. Um, a city can fund a stream bank restoration project. That's not part of the conveyance system. Um, the city can do uh, a ravine stabilization um, project. But again, it's not part of the conveyance system. And those techniques can achieve really significant pollutant load reductions at quite cost-efficient rates. And yet, in the context of the MS4 permit, the city can do that work and does not get any credit for doing that work. Now, on one level, that's an absurd, almost absurdly simple trading 
program right. that ought to happen. Which and is, maybe we're make we're taking steps toward. Yeah, that's aha. like that's the thing that makes the most sense. Yeah, and that's why we have incorporated the language into the guidance, like because we understand there's lots of barriers with you know city councils approving for projects outside of the city limits. Yes, do the stuff within your city that currently you cannot take credit for you under this trading program you would be able to oh all that stuff you just said hot dog yep <laughs> but you gotta talk to yeah, me go ahead <laughs> i was just gonna add i think in some parts of minnesota it is an advantage to have a watershed district because then they can help implement a lot of those projects and in a lot of cases they're willing to help fund those mm -hmm. um and it does help and hopefully ms4s will be able to take advantage of a lot of those projects that are going in that may be just outside city limits that would be mm -hmm. great to see right. yeah and a watershed district can bring technical capacity mm -hmm. and some additional staff capacity for inspections and accounting and bookkeeping right. and all that good stuff even monitoring in some cases yeah. 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 true so so something i just want to highlight and, and you can comment uh actually builds upon something Randy said in his relation to the topic, oh. maximum extent practicable, right? It's not numeric. There's no consistent baseline above which we could calculate bonus, which then could be traded. That's kind of the thing that I'm seeing here. We're missing some, you talked also about tools that's trusted across the state by everybody that's involved. I feel like that's still a missing tool, but maybe that's that's where we need to work towards. It seems like we're close or we have maybe some of this in place. We're just not making use of it where we can figure out where and when are we above the line and we have excess that we can trade and when are we below the line where we still have to get up to that level. Any comments or thoughts or anything on that? That's something I've just noticed. It's yeah. carrying through almost all these answers. So the above the line is a pretty... I find I I think it would be much easier for MS4s to sort of that uh, buying things or putting in practices that otherwise aren't uh, sort of available to them um, is an easier bar to cross than an MS4 selling credits to another MS4 sure. that you would have to have some super super solid data mm -hmm. for us to be able to do that based on a waste load allocation or whatever, but there that's, I'm not going to point anyone in that direction. <laughs> it's more on the other side in Minnesota right now. Right. Yep. Well, and, and that challenge is one of the reasons why I'm now really interested and optimistic about Anna's comment about this, this internal trading, you know, we're, we're going to do an impound treatment in a, a lake that's within the city, and we'll use that to offset some other stuff that's happening elsewhere in the city, that um, because it's internal, it's kind of within the framework that's governed by MEP. So MEP becomes almost irrelevant. Um, it's just an internal trading exercise, and maybe that'll work. So now I really want to see how that plays out. Very optimistic. Looking forward to having one of my communities be part of this. It's time to stop immediately. <laughs> we have a question up here. Do you still have a question? It seems like the the trading opportunity is really where there's like it's based on land use, right? There's commercial, industrial, or city owned, you know, public property. What about watersheds that are dominated by single family residential. Is there any opportunity or like, how do you incentivize that? I, I think Randy kind of hit with this utility crediting maybe is the way. So I kind of answered my own question as I was listening, but that's, that's where I was thinking is on that residential watershed. Well, the, the Morrisville project I talked about, those were in, that was in a development, Providence Place. Um, a lot of dry ponds, especially dry ponds and some buyer, but mostly dry ponds are present in, in residential properties. Um, because they're required to be inspected, all right, and homeowners associations pay for that, um, the homeowner association will then hire companies to do the inspection and keep those practices working so that the town doesn't have to 
levy a fine or something on them for, for having their stormwater control measures go out of compliance. That's important because that means that residential areas um, that have practices that are you know, subject or potentially good uplift options become a place where the, the typically the homeowner station itself is not the one that's going to be, I don't think it's going to be the one that's going to be engaged or maybe it'll take a cut, a little bit of a cut. It's going to be the people that do the maintenance on them. That That's what's happening in North Carolina. The private, the, the push in the private side is in great part. We have really big maintenance companies and they're the ones that they, they're, they have the contract to maintain these five dry ponds in Providence Place. Well, let's just convert all of them, all right? And, they, and they're the ones that are going to be doing the trading. But the practices themselves are owned or a part of, a, of a neighborhood and they're managed by a homeowner association. So I actually do see a lot of opportunity for, the, for those homeowner associations. It's just, they're probably not the ones that are going to be driving it. It's going to be the, the, the maintenance staff, ma maintenance firms. And it's, it's not exactly trading, but it's this linkage where what I'm interested in is the linkage between TMDLs and MS4 permits. So we now have a lot of MS4 permittees that need to continue to make demonstrated progress toward meeting their waste load allocations. Um, and then things like these retrofit projects on existing SCMs, our residential neighborhoods are full of stormwater ponds. They're full of rain gardens and bioinfiltration, et cetera, et cetera. And, and those, these retrofit projects can achieve pollutant load reductions that can now go into the MS4's annual reports and pollutant load uh, reduction estimates and become the demonstration of continued progress. So it's kind of trading, <laughs> maybe. I just add that um, there's some MS4s that have been looking at all city owned property and trying to figure out opportunities for BMPs. Parks are a big one. Cities are starting to realize we don't need to be mowing all of this area. Is there something else we can do? And so looking at, can we get any credit or is there any other opportunities that we could use for those spaces by putting in some type of BMP? So that's another way, even in you know neighborhood parks and all your residential areas, looking at opportunities like that. Any other thoughts? All right, well, we will move into the close for the panel. We're running very short on time. So we're gonna close with our key takeaways questions. So what I'd like for each panel member to do is give us your key takeaways or any last minute thoughts before we close today's session. And we're gonna start in the same order that we did uh, introductions. So Anna, you get to go first. What are your key takeaways today? Uh, key takeaways are there if people are willing, I mean, you the agency is willing to talk and think about this. So I know there's been some like comments about we're really hard to work with, but <laughs> we we have the willing spirit. So you know, <laughs> I'm blaming Randy. It's fine. Um anyway, but uh if if municipalities are looking at something, I would encourage them to reach out early. We certainly don't want you to come to us with a plan completely finished, be like, here, approve this. I, we gotta like get in on the ground floor and make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, but I, there's that you go. Okay. <laughs> Randy, what would be your key takeaways? Um, so the first one is, is how cost efficient stormwater SEM retrofits are. That's a big piece of news. Um, the PCA's work toward uh, internal trading is, is another thing. The, the last piece, and we, we touched on it just a little bit at the end, which is the notion that regulatory credits become a currency that is enormously valuable in multiple contexts. It's valuable in the, in the context of, of trading. It's also valuable in the context of making demonstrated progress. And the PCA has made uh, put a lot of work into improving 
the numeric, the whole crediting system. God knows there's still work to be done, but we've we've come a long ways. And that currency um, is important. Rebecca. So some of my key takeaways are similar to Randy's where I didn't realize how cost effective doing some simple retrofits can be. That's very promising um, in working with cities where budgets are tight. The other is that the state is working on a lot of this and I like to try things and find out what works. So having an agency that's willing to work with us and try it in different communities is really good to hear. Thank you, Rebecca. Bill, you get the last word. What are your key takeaways today? Uh, a big one is that the idea that the first round of this trading can can be within a jurisdiction. I think there was, and I thought about it, so that's kind of what happened with us too. Sure. So that is a huge takeaway. And the other thing, I'm gonna, this next one's a reiteration. I am a huge fan of urban areas being the places that get uplifted versus uh, versus ag areas, okay. okay? In that the development's occurring and the people who can basically see and touch where the, the uplift occurs, it's tangible in urban, you know, I want the people where the development's occurring to be able to gain those benefits. And I, I didn't make that enough of a point, I really, and that's part of the reason why I'm so happy about the idea of taking existing, often dilapidated stormwater infrastructure or just barely good enough infrastructure and making it much better for the benefit of the citizens who live around it. And I think of all the places, Minnesota is a great place to embrace that. That's great. Thank you, Bill. And thank you, panelists. Uh, thank you for serving on the panel today. I want to thank the audience, both the in-person and the online audience for joining us today. Uh, stay tuned for future Minnesota Stormwater Seminar Series events. Next month, July, is our Minnesota Stormwater Research Council annual meeting. And then you will see the calendar of events for the next set of seminar series. Thanks again for joining us. We hope to see you at a future event. Thank you very much.